uh, once again, we've got one of our uh, distinguished, uh, one of the distinguished um, lecturers, uh, um, and, and, and uh, today we've got uh, Dr. Khalid Al Hazemi. Uh, do I pronounce it? Uh, he's a professor of endodontics and periodontics. He is the founder of the growth of the of uh, uh, factors and bone regeneration research centers and the 3D uh, advanced imaging lab in 2008 at uh, King's, uh, uh, King Saud University. He served uh, as the GFBR chairman uh, from 2009 to 2017. He's also uh, served uh, at the general director of, uh, of the vision office at the KSU, where he helped to, to develop strategies aimed at uh, strengthening university uh, transformation. Uh, I, and, um, uh, and your CV is so rich. Uh, uh, you've got clinical practice limited to endodontics and periodontics. You published over a hundred uh, papers in collaboration with local, regional, and international research groups. You uh, uh, also you authored uh, multiple chapters, and I see that uh, one of them is Ingle by Endodontics. Uh, uh, um, so, um, and we are very happy to have uh, you with us, uh, and I don't want to take more of your time because we are very eager to. Uh, hear from you and uh, you can screen share your uh, lecture and uh, we are all yours. Sugar. Um, I'm trying to share the screen. It says the host disabled your screen. Can you give me permission? Oh. Okay, great. Um, Awalan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Um, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, is the slide clear? The slides are very clear. Okay. Um uh Ashkirkum Jimmy and Al Hadur, Shikran Jimmy and Al Dawa Taiba, the Ahbab Nabi Arab. Uh today's lecture is going to be uh, the most advanced hot topics in Endidont. I've been working this for almost uh 14 years. And this is probably the cutting edge, uh, toward the end of the lecture, you'll see the cutting edge of research in the human being, which is that pulp revitalization or regeneration. These are uh, semantics and terms, shall we say regeneration or revitalization, or should we say revascularization? All these are confusing terms. We're going to go through it today. I'd appreciate if you can take any pictures of written slides, but images or videos, please uh, don't, uh, except for the recording, because some of them are under patent copyright. The lecture outline today is a basic structure, because uh, I want you to go back to remember what the basic structures of pulp and dentin. That will help us to go and understand how can we reform them again? 
and the reason and the mechanism are reformation or regeneration or revitalization of these structures. History backgrounds of pulp capping, history of regeneration terms. It's very important why the history of regeneration terms, because I think it's important and proper to treat the proper diagnostic condition. And then we can look at the biomimicry mediators and its application in endodonic regeneration. Uh, we're going to take an example of one of these proteins that has application to inhibit replacement resorption and guided tissue regeneration, IPCA regeneration, pulp regeneration, and the growth factor as application of pulpal regeneration or revitalization. It is very important to understand the function of the tooth depends on the health and vitality of prudentium, not on the status of the pulp only. We always think about the status of the pulp, but I think it's very important. These two structures are very interrelated together, the pulp and the prudentium. So we have to understand both of them and both of them are very important to um, the health of pulp tissue. Pulpal anatomy is very important because if you do any regeneration procedure or if you do any revitalization procedure, we should have this tooth have a sensory and nutrition and formative capacity, defensive capacity and protective capacity. If this pulp cannot do this function, it doesn't seem that you have regenerated the same tissue. It's probably different tissue because we know from the original anatomy of the pulp tissue, sensory exists. So that's why we feel temperature, feel cold. And that's why we have the nutrition by the blood supply to the pulp and dentin. Formation, the pulp continues throughout life to form dentin. The defense, when you have low grade infection of caries, you have the tertiary dentin. So therefore, the any newly formed tissue, it has to meet these criteria of the original pulp and dentin tissue function. Content of the pulp. We have a very important contents. Cells are dentoblasts, fibroblasts, or cells and differentiating zinc. So, so if we do any pulp regeneration or revitalization, we have to see a, a an under the subadontoblast exam, there is a subadontoblast there, uh, lacunae. That will be the same as the original tissue. Then there's a fibrous matrix, which is mostly collagen type three and ground substance that act as a medium to transmit nutrients to cells and metabolize the cells to the blood vessels. These could be boring now, but you're going to appreciate it later on by the end of the presentation. These are very important fundamental for any endodontist. Type of dentins. Why this is also important because we, when we form when we do pop capping using MTA, for example, what type of dentin we are forming? Is it the same dentin we lost or is it different dentin? Therefore, it's important for us as endodontists to understand what type of dentin that existed in the first place. We have the primary dentin, we have the secondary dentin, and we have also the pretubular, intertubular, mantle dentin, and circumpulpal dentin. And the difference between these dentins are the porosity, the type of collagen there, the hardness, uh, physical uh, structure characteristic of these dentins. So it's very important when you have these dentins to understand them. So when you do pulp capping or regeneration, we understand what type of dentin we get. Is it similar to secondary dentin, which is the idea of dentin we have? Or similar to tertiary dentin, or it's a dentin-like materials then actually similar to primary dentin or not similar to secondary dentin. 
it's which I'm going to show you later on some of the research we had before. So the pulp therapy always um, um, we had in the past when we have a pulp exposure like this in the upper left picture, you see two pulp horns, two exposures. What we do if the bleeding stop, we just put the MTA about one millimeter and then permanent restoration. Then after that, we just go ahead and just follow up the patient to, to make sure uh, there's- Dr. Khalid, Dr. Khalid uh, can you do a full screen to the, to the uh, picture? I think it will be clearer. Yeah, this is nice. Thank you okay. very much. No worries. So if you look at the top picture, you could say there's pop hole exposed. Uh, and the mesobuccal buccal also partially in the palatal. So the bleeding stop, we know we have a vital tissue. We put MTA, and the only evidence we have, we just take a radiograph to see a very thin radio-opaque line. Now, does that radio-opaque line that shows in the radiograph, mesodistally, does it cover the pulp entirely from 360 degree in terms of 3D dimension. Does it cover bucolingually? We don't know. We don't have these answers before. So we're going to demonstrate to you today, to show you what happened actually in real life if you use uh, any pop cam material. But this is the limitation. That's the best we got nowadays. So this is the secondary dentin uh, characteristic you see. It's not highly porous, not a very slightly porous. It's, a, it's, it's I would say in the middle, it has a lot of collagen um, in them. So why this picture is important? Because this is the ideal dentin that if we are able to form, they'll be called regeneration because this is a dentin we lost in the first place. So secondary dentin is formed after the enamel of the crown is fully formed. Crown permanent teeth remain in the jaws for two, three years prior to eruption. Dentogenesis continues at slow rate during this time, and dentin issue had less mineralized in the bulk of the dentin and only intertubular matrix mineralized. And these are old past studies and others, which is uh, they have spent a extensive investigation in dentin. You can look at Franklin Tay, Pashley, David Pashley, they have done a lot there. Secondary dentin, any subsequent dentin form is referred to be as secondary dentin, continues to be formed after the tooth has erupted. And the degree of mineralization of intertubular matrix assume high degree of mineralization, similar to that in the main part of dentin. The particular mineralization pattern is characteristic feature of coronal dentin and is not found in the root dentin. Now, why is it important? Because in endodontics, until today, the only way we can characterize dentin is by histology. And it is subjective. You could see it as porous. I could see it as non-porous. So we didn't have a, a very quantitative method until today to quantify the dentin density for each type of dentin. Secondary dentin formation can be a slow rate during the life of the tooth, both in the crown and the root. It should be differentiated from localized regular tertiary dentin formed in response to post eruptive external stimuli like caries, crown preparation. So these are the four layers of dentin. You have the odontogenic zone, which is important, and where you see the odontoblast. Then you have media subadjacent odontoblastic layers of what we call sulfury zone of Fayili. And then we have the sulfur rich zone, and then we have the innervation. And the reason I'm 
put in this image, I want you to keep it in your mind when we go through the histology of some of the baboons and human studies. These are very important. If we, if we see pulpal tissue that doesn't have that dontoplastic zone and doesn't have the cell free zone of Faili, where you have the sub odontoplastic lacunae, that is not a pulpal regeneration or dentin regeneration. So that's, these are tissues are different from the original tissue that we lost due to caries or infection. And we're going to go through the definition of free generation. Why is it important to understand the definition of free generation? Now let's go to the history background of pulp capping. Now we know from the famous study by Kakashi, bacterial exposure uh, is the main reason for pulp infection. This is the classic study and the most cited paper in endodontics. Now, what are the factors that affect the direct pulp capping? The self healing capacity of the pulp, because it doesn't have collateral um, blood supply. Now, if you have if you have a wound in your skin, you have a huge, significant amount of blood supply under your skin from adjacent tissue, and the pulp or the tooth doesn't have collateral and extra blood supply and the absence of bacteria, the proper hemorrhage control and the sealing capacity of the pulp cavity material, which we uh, was improved with the MTA. Let's look at what being used currently in the past about pulp capping materials. We have casmine oxide, composites, resin modified, glass enamel, calcium phosphate, MTA, alloplast materials, biomimic remediators. Uh, I think everybody in the audience have probably used calcium hydroxide and it's well known for a lot of people that they use calcium hydroxide. And we know it was um, made a popular by stick technique by using the pulpotomy technique. And um, it was in the 1970s when Schroeder and Svick introduced the direct pulp capping and direct pulp capping using casmine dioxide. But it's very interesting, if you go through the literatures, you'd see a huge uh, polarized results of casmine dioxide. You find Svick Results, it's about 95% success rate between th three and 15 years old. And you find in the other polarized side, about 10% success rate. And that's very interesting that we need to understand. The direct pulp capping is by placement of material against the pulp tissue directly ex during exposure by care excavation. It was considered controversial at that time by Trinstad, Langland in Connecticut, Bergen Halls in Sweden, others. Now, uh, Bowman holds, they think there's about 90% success rate compared to Spick, who says 95. But what, what's the problem with casmic side? It's a strong alkali, which means it could irritate make the pulp tissue necrose because of its high alkali. Very, very poor seal, doesn't seal the pulp tissue. Degradation over time, the presence of tunnel defects in every dentin has been formed after the casamander site, <laughs> which has been evident, and we will show you some of the histology. When you have tunnel defects and the dentin, it means the dentin is not sealed at all. So you could see on the figure A, there's a dentin, but if you higher magnify in the figure B, you could see where there's a red arrow, you see there's a tunnel defect space between dentin. They're not completely continuous. So that gives communication to the bacteria, to the pulp tissue, 
and doesn't help to protect the pulp tissue. Now, their pulp cap, tunnel defect with the dentin bridge may provide a pathway for a microorganism which will induce pulp irritation, produce subsequent dystrophic calcification. That's why we see a lot of calcification, root canal calcification after the calcimeric side used as pulp capping. Now, let's see why there are difference in terms of the results of calcium dioxide in the trichers. First of all, the first reason, it's the length of the follow-up between studies. So you find somebody uh, follow up for a few months, somebody follow up for one year, somebody follow up for two years. This gave a discrepancy because the pulp tissue could start and it occurs within two years or after three years. Now the Second one is the time of pulp exposure, which is very, very fundamental. So you cannot compare if this pulp being diagnosed as a reversible pulpitis compared to reversible pulpitis. So that's that one that was not included in these studies in the past. The presence of blood clot, time of defensive frustration, presence of infection as well age of the patient was ignored in the past and the pre-op diagnosis. So we know direct pop capping, we know from both, which is a famous study in the, in the Journal of the American Administration, where he used uh, MTA as direct pop capping in a patient and he followed up them over nine years and he had 98% of success rate. And this is only about clinical examination and there's no um, uh, deep or 3D imaging or anything else. Now, compared calcium oxide and um, MTA and monkeys, we know the first study was 1996 between Trabinijad and Pitford where they found MTA showed a lot better presence of newly formed dentin than calcium dioxide. And Pitford found significantly more pulp inflammation was observed in the pulp treated with calcium dioxide and less dentin bridge formation compared to MTA. These are very important criteria, the formation, quality, thickness of calcified bridge, presence of inflammatory cells, Preservation of pulp are considered evaluation criteria after pulp therapy. I, I would urge each one of you to take a shot of this slide. This is very important. If anybody can bring you a technique or anything, I think that's important for you to understand these criteria being laid out by Pitford. Now, direct pulp capping, um, why MTA is great uh, pulp capping material? because it's not absorbable, has great margin sealability, biocompatible, alkaline pH 12.5, antibacterial, antifungal. We have studied MTA, antibacterial, antifungal for about five to six papers. We published them in Journal of Endodonics. I found it has poses some significant amount of um, antibacterial, antifungal. Now, we move now to the history of free generation terms. <clears throat> Ostomy began the um, evaluated, uh, he's one of the first people began the uh, regeneration terms, and they tried to use uh, a chlorobarca paste with galapurcha, but it didn't succeed. That failures by Ostomy in Scandinavian countries led to abandon a lot of free generation research from 1960s to the 1990s. When they abandoned the regeneration research, research from 70s to the 1990s, 
the trauma studies began by Scotland, and he's the first one to confirm the revascularization term exists for EVALS T. Now, revascularization, it's, it's the restoration of blood supply, which doesn't happen by Martin Trub paper in 2002, when they put the triple antibiotics and they put um, uh, revascularization term, the truth there, they did revitalization because revascularization means bringing the two blood vessels together again, and they were before together, and that doesn't happen. And that's why nowadays they don't much use revascularization term. Revitalization, it's a correct term. Describe the fact more accurately after what suggested the term revascularization for auto-transplanted teeth and term revitalization for infection-related cases. Let's talk about regeneration, which is the fun thing. Jim Simon, my mentor at USA, he says in essence, endodonics are epicoperidonis. Now, the term by American Association of Endodontics is very, very difficult and complex. And it says it's a biologically based procedure designed to physiologically replace damaged tooth structures, including dented and root structures, as well as cells of pulp and dental complex. Now, if we want to simplify these definitions, it's a lot better to say what, to re what structure did we lose so we can regenerate. In other words, we go to the definition by the American Association of Perinatology. We have to understand the endodontic treatment designed to halt progression of endodontic related attachment structure, loss, through diagnosis treatment of endodontic disease. The second objective designed to regenerate, reconstruct lost tissue through guided tissue regeneration. Very important. So if you have a, an, a, a destructions of a tissue, we have to understand what did we lost. And the original definition is regeneration is um, Reconstitution, what has been lost due to endodontic disease. Now let's look at the application of growth factors or mimicry mediators and endodontics, which probably now is going to be uh, your interest more now. Now let's look at the enamel matrix protein. What's the enamel matrix protein? Uh, the IDF again was to try to mimic the events that took place during development of dental roots. When the root sheet first we mean dental papillates disintegrate and release what we call enamel matrix protein. That will induce dentogenesis, cementogenesis, and downregulate osteocalcin to downregulate bone formation. Now, the this is why enamax protein uh, being, uh, began by Slavkin at USC, 1970s, and by Linsko and Hammerstrom in Sweden. They believed they, are, they were able to form cementum and dentin by endogame. Let's see some of the clinical uh, experiments, then I will take you to a case report that I published to show you why MD gain it could be sometimes helpful. There are experimental studies and there are preclinical and clinical studies. Orhan, he used MD gain to quantify the numbers of dentoplasts, and he used uh, rats. He put a, a dark pulp capping using uh, um, MTA and MD gain, compared them together, and he found MD gain. Uh, it has the potential to be good direct pulp capping protocol. Also, he did a human study and teeth planned to be extracted for orthodontic reason. But what his problem, he 
is MD GAN alone. He did not use MTA or any other materials because the protein is unstable. So what he found, he found MD GAN can form dentin, but is that a good dentin? You could see in the left side picture, there's a lot of tunnel defects. Is that continuous? So he concluded MD GAN doesn't seem to be effective for direct pulp cavity protocol. So we always need to think about how we can work with materials as well. And that's why it's important. I gave that introduction about the background of anatomy and physiology. And let's look at the endogen application and dynamics. Inhibition of replacement resorption. Now this girl came to me in about 21 years ago. Um, do you see uh, anything on tooth number 10? Anybody would answer? Do you hear me? Sorry, sir. Doctor Hussain, yeah. does anyone you... see anything on tooth number 10, the lateral incisor on the left side? Yeah. Does anybody want to answer? Some kind of ulcer or something. There's a sinus tract. Yeah. So what do you think about this? But it's very cervical. It's not in the epithelial region. It's, uh, it's more of very dental. There's no bone, right? All the bones gone, resolved. Yeah. Correct? Mm -hmm. The tooth has great mobility three. So the diagnosis in this tooth was not just only pulp necrosis, was also a palato gingival group. So what I did, I did a root canal. Then I waited six weeks. I extracted the tooth. I bore out the, I smoothened the group. I replanted within two minutes. I put MD gain in the tooth and MD gain in the socket. And you still have her too. And this is why I extracted the tooth after the root canal. I smoothened the groove. And this is one year later. Okay. And you could see partial bone res resolution, correct? How about possibilities of ankylosis in such cases? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, that's why I use them again to inhibit replacement resorption. And this is six years later. You could see complete PDL space, no ankylosis. Yeah, lamina dura is good. Yeah. So, um, this is one of the application of endogain and endodonics to prevent replacement resorption if you need it. Imagine if this, she was a girl 14 years old. Imagine if we extracted this tooth for her. She would not be able to get the implants. If you uh, extract it, you lose a lot of bone. You will need GBR. GBR is the most difficult thing in the lateral incisors region. Now, uh, let's move to a second question, Dr. Hussain. If you have a root canal, um, if you have a tooth with periodontal problem and needed root canal, do you think that tooth, if you do a root canal, would be regenerating periodontally the same as well as a vital tooth? Anyone can answer the question? Does root canal treated teeth regenerate the same as a vital teeth? Uh, 
Well, in cases no. of vital teeth, I think the possibilities of regeneration are much, much better. We're talking about periodontal regeneration. For example, if you have a three wall defect, five millimeter around root country tooth, or five millimeter uh, pocket around vital tooth, which one will regenerate periodontally better? So that's a very important question. That's why we did this research here. So what we did, we did uh, um, create dehiscence around teeth and we treated them. Some of them are vital teeth. Some of them are root country teeth, as you can see here in dogs. Then we did induced dehiscence, periodontal uh, pockets. And then we treated them with endogain and regenerative materials. And we created a notch because we want people in the histology to understand where's the base of the bony defects. So this is after the surgery. Now this is a control group. You could see on the left side, you could see after the notch, there's a bone on the right of the picture and the left, that's the tooth. You could see in the right side, more and highly magnified. The, uh, and the right and the right side picture, you could see the end of the notch and the beginning of the um, bright purple. That's the old cementum. Now, this is a test group where you have root canal being treated, and then periodontal regeneration happened. OC mean old cementum. N is mean notch. NC means uniform cementum. You could see in the right side, you see the circle, the black circle, that's where the newly formed cementum and the, the old cementum meet. Now, this is a great histological um, slide. You could see this small fragile uh, cementum with sharp fibers on them. And this is from endodontically treated teeth. And this is again, if you see the arrow point to a newly formed cementum of fruit can treat tooth. So therefore, root can treat teeth regenerate prudently the same as well as uh, vital teeth. And we published this in uh, 2010 and we called connect tissue cementum regeneration. Now, EDCA regeneration. Um, uh, Dr. Hussain? Yes. Do you guys do EDCA surgery a lot or? Because surgery, yes. But we're starting with. Yeah. Are you guys interested that I go a bit in the epical surgery? No, if you can emphasize on the epical regeneration, it would be. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not going to take a lot of time. So okay. let's ask a question. So if you do epical surgery, what are you trying to regenerate? What did you lose there? What structures we lose? We lost there, Doctor Hussain. Well, of course, bone. So we lost bone. We lost cementum. We lost PDL. Correct. Yeah. So we need to regenerate these three tissues there. Is that of correct? Course. So That's we right. have to have a PDL inserted and in cementum, and we have to have bone. Mm -hmm. And so we have those three structures. If we didn't have them, that's not a regeneration, that's repair. Mm -hmm. So this is, for example, a case where you have a, a long sand carries, you do root canals, still there's epical lesion there. So we have to understand what did we lose there? And so we can aim 
when we do surgery, we have to think about planning how to reconstruct the tissue that we lost in the first place. So what we did, um, uh, um, what we did, um, we uh, I did um, uh, a longest canine study. We have kept these dogs for thirty months. Hopefully, this paper will come out soon, uh, in about nine months from now. Um, it's a virus study uh, on uh, dogs. We use uh, PDGF, and also we use uh, other materials. What we did, we induced, um, we induced, you could see in the left side, we induced the first premolar P1, second premolar P2, third premolar P3, fourth premolar P4. Dogs has four premolars. So we induced pre collision, then we did endodontic treatment, then we have four groups. The first group was um, curtage alone, it was control, second one was curtage, a third one was MTA, a fourth was MTA and PDGF, and fifth was curtage and PDGF. So this is uh, the, uh, you could say in the P1, that's curtage alone. You could see there's a lot of bone loss. There's not much of regeneration of bone or PDL there. The P2 is the MTA epicectomy. We could see partial formation of cementum, not complete bone formation, which is understood because MTA is not osteoconductive. Now, MTA epicotectomy, um, you could see uh, in a very higher power here, where uh, if you look at figure B, you could see there is not a complete bone formation. And figure C, you could see there's still a large space. And if you look at figure D, where is the blue arrow, the cementum doesn't cover completely the MTA. Now, if we take MTA plus PDGA, it produces a lot of results, a lot better. We could see there's no bone formation. If you look at um, figure B, you could see cementum has covered the MTA. And if you look at figure C, which is out zoom, the MTA was covered uh, by the cementum. And the very interesting thing, if you look at figure uh, H in the bottom, in the middle, you see where's the white circle? Is that clear to you, Dr. Hussain? Yeah, yeah, very clear. You see the MTA apicoectomy there, the white uh, apical part? Despite it's very close to the maxillary sinus of a dog, look at the bone formation on top of the tube. So it was great results. You can see it in G on the left side, P1 and P2. Look at the bone formation when we use this combination. And the same thing here, when we use Curtage and PDGF, you could see the result was actually outstanding here. Now the question here, what's the ultimate outcomes always in endodontics, pulpal regeneration? That's the most important topic today I want to spend the last 15, 20 minutes on. Now we always think about, uh, is there a dentin or no dentin by meaning of do we see a radio opaque line in the radiographs or not? And what type of dentin, is it porous or not? So these are very subjective terms and it doesn't give us really good um, uh, sustainable long-term outcomes. So uh, again, I think understanding these terms very important, regeneration or repair. Regeneration, as I said before, was reconstitution of lost structures 
due to endodontic disease, period. So it doesn't matter how you reconstitute them, which materials. It's very important that they have the same function. Now, uh, I'm gonna take to this um, uh, growth factor application and pulpal regeneration. It, we published this in 2011, the histomorphometric and microcomputer tomography analysis of pulpal response to three differentiated pulp cavity materials. So then we published a follow-up study on hybrid approach to direct pulp capping by using MDGAIN with a capping material. So what we did in the first part, we did use MTA alone, calcium oxide alone, and Gerstor alone. The second part, which is the hybrid approach, we added MDGAIN to each one of these materials to see the difference. So, the calcium hydroxide alone, you could say this is in baboons and monkeys. So you could see it's the same thing in the left side image or on the right side image. There's no complete continuity of dentum uh, regeneration or reformation over the pulp tissue. And this is a microcomputer tomography, axial sections, 0.1 millimeter. After 0.1 millimeter, we see no dentin at all. And if you look at uh, 0.1 millimeter, the dentin only about 40% of the orifice, which is not a good outcome. So if we take a calcium oxide with MDGAIN, we find more calcification and more dentin formation in the hair. Now, if we use white MTA or MTA alone, we see, as we have seen in the literatures, about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeter dentin. When we use it with MDGAIN, it produced some calcification there. Now, this is a radiograph. We could say there's a good amount of dentin bridge, but also there's epical calcification. Which I will show you here. You could see the 3D. You could see here, this is exactly the same radiograph. You could see why I'm turning this because I wanted to see if there's any periapical lesion or pulpal necrosis, which doesn't exist. This is the, uh, the block of the bone completely uh, of a tooth. So you could see 360 degrees. This tooth is vital, has no necrosis. You could see follow the PDL on this tooth here. But there's apical calcification here. I could turn the block, you could visualize the band any way you like. There's no necrosis here. Now I, I, I want you to focus here. Now I took a cross section and I did a microcomputer tomography analysis, which is very important. The yellow is the newly formed dentin. The red is the original dentin, the blue is MTA. I want you to pay attention if there's any porosity, which means there are spaces, you could see some spaces in that materials. So in the yellow, you could see it's almost like a rock stone you see no porosity compared to the red, where the red, this is a very high magnification. This is 0 0.018 micron. So if we, we're going to come closer to the yellow part material, which is the newly formed dentin section. You could see there's no spaces there. So this is, give us an idea, this is not a real, original secondary dentin. This is a dentin-like material. I could show you here, it's just like a rock stone here. Compared to the red, you could see some spaces here, some spaces here. So when we had MTA treated groups, we saw a lot of spindle-shaped odontoblast cells active. You could see them here too. 
So these are the exit cross sections of calcium oxide with MDK. You could see up, up to a 0.4 and the same thing with MTA and MDK. A lot better with these materials alone. And also the same thing for port and cement. Now, what's a new hybrid technique for pulp regeneration? We did micro CT and histomorphometric analysis of pulp response to different pulp cabin materials. So what we did, um, this is the first human randomized clinical trials in the world. We published them last year in August and September. Patients were planned for extraction of the teeth for orthodontic reasons. So we admit those patients. All these teeth were healthy. Uh, some had some carries, no present problem. What we did, we took three angles pre ab graph followed by vertical bite wings. Uh, we have consented the patients. Uh, single ended eyes perform all the procedure. So what we did, we randomized uh, those patients to the following groups. We have calcium dioxide alone, MTA alone, growth factor plus calcium dioxide, MDGAN plus calcium dioxide, growth factor plus MTA, MDGAN plus MTA. So it's six groups. All goes around calcium hydroxide MTA plus MDGAN or growth factor. So I'll show you um, the video, uh, some of the cases we did. So we open, we send the patient after the bleeding stopped, we put cotton pellets, we send the patient for an hour to drink something to induce some inflammation. Patient comes back, we clean it, then we put either MTA alone, then followed by amalgam. And if you look at, we very gently go uh, condense these materials. We don't want to traumatize pulp tissues, very important. You could say that's second case where we have uh, stop the bleeding, we put um, casematic side. They very gently. Then the last one I'll show you, we're going to put the growth factor protein. And then we put the NTA on top of it in a very gentle way uh, to keep, uh, not to displace the protein. After we uh, irrigate sodium, bleeding stop. Now we go there gently, start to put Now we start to put the, this is a protein, the growth factor. Now we put the growth factor in the orifice. You could say we fill the orifice, followed by MTA very gently. We don't want to displace it. Then we'll put amalgam. So we uh, called the patient the first week almost daily basis, and we had six weeks follow-up and four months follow-up. This is a pre-op figure A, uh, B immediate after uh, post-operative, C is four months following the uh, pulp cabin materials. And this is a micro CT here. It's similar to the baboon results, similar to other results in literature. We don't see uh, good outcomes. Uh, and I'll show you in the 3D that we produce. That's a human, by the way. That's a human tooth. So let me explain to you. The blue is the amalgam. The purple is the casmine oxide. The orange is the newly formed dentin. So what we'll be doing now, I'll be taking off one structure at a time. 
we're going to rotate the tooth, take off the amalgam, then take out the purple, which is calcium oxide. Now, I want you to focus. Do you see a big defect in the dentin? Yes. You cannot see this in the radiograph because you take a radiograph and it's distally and you see all dentin there. So, now if you come closer, that's a huge, huge, big defect in the dentin buckling, really, that we don't see in the radiographs. So, and we could see epically from the apex, there's no calcification, nothing there. We didn't see. So we're going to go inside and examine the epical part and go in if we see any sign of calcification. So the, the root is normal. There's no sign of resorption. If there was necrosis, we would see it. So we, now we just go going from the bottom to the top, you could see a lot of defects in the dentin that has formed here. So this is not a good dentin that seals the pulp tissue from the external stimuli. Then now uh, MTA alone. A is a pre-op, B is a immediate post-op, C is a um, four months follow-up. We see a radio opaque line, as we said before. You could see it's a very thin line as compared to the literature, it's about 0.2 millimeters. But if we look at here, now I, I want you to compare both sides. Now I put the MTA in the left side, I put the Casper side in the right side. <laughs> Now we're going to remove now the amalgam, the blue structures. Remove the MTA and side. You can see here, there's I um, not completely seeing the axial walls or the pulp tissue on the MTA side. And we've seen before with the Kazmierich side and the right side, there's a big defect. Now we'll continue with the MTA to watch it alone. You can see it's on the left side, the MTA, it's very thin. I'll just take it here. Now you can see there's a gap between the dentin and the axial wall here that you cannot see in the ordinary radiograph here. Now, Casimir Island again, you could see A pre op, B um, immediate, C the uh, four months, you could see a very thick newly formed dentin in the radiograph figure C. When you put MD gain and uh, calcium oxide, and this is similar to the baboon study we had. So this is a 3D model, as you could see. Again, the blue is amalgam, the purple is the calcium oxide, the orange is the newly formed dentin. Now you can see now here, it's completely um, sealing the pulp tissue. And if you see these dots and the orange structure, 
That's great news for us because it's mimic the Sikandra Dinti has some porosity to it. Now you could see, examine it from the bottom, from the upper part, you go flip the two. These are human teeth, by the way, again, to remind you. And you can actually, these videos, it's, uh, it does exist in YouTube by Quintessence Publisher. I can send it to Dr. Hussain and uh, you guys can view them. So you could see um, in the apex here from the bottom, you could see it's completely sealing the pulp of tissue here. And when we did MTA with MDGAIN, figure A, you could see pre op, B, post op, immediate, C, four months. Micro CT, you could see uh, a good thickness, continuous um, newly formed dentin over the pulp tissue. Uh, calcium oxide plus growth factor. So, um, you can see A, where is the uh, pre op, B, mid post op, C. You can see there's a very distinctive newly formed dentin over the pulp tissue with no calcification. You can see it here, very nice thickness, pulpal. Uh, uniform dentin. And when we use MTA and growth factor, um, you could say the pre op A, B is a post op immediate, C four months. And this is uh, a beautiful newly formed dentin, no root count calcification. The bottom right, that's because of the superimposition of the two root canals. So um, you could see here very clearly, this is a, a human tooth. The uh, blue is amalgam, we're going to remove it. Then the purple is MTA, we're going to remove it. We're going to assess the newly formed dentin. How does it see the pulp uh, space? Uh, 360 degrees. Now, if we look at here, very beautifully have sealed the pulpal space here. It actually has extended extra on the axial wall on the right and left. And if you go from the apex, there is no calcification. You can go from the epical foramina, go through the root canals, and it's normal. There's no resorption, lacunae or anything. You could see the dentin here is completely sealing the pulpal space. Completely. There's no gap. There's nothing there. So this is what we should be looking for. This is a great image, actually, it just to show you how continuous, completely sealing 360 degrees, the pulpal space. Now, does this dentin that we saw now in the micro CT, does it really similar to secondary dentin or different dentin? So we have to look at the um, uh, histological analysis. So in our paper, the evaluation of free competent human plated drug growth factor or unanimous routine, plus calcium oxide for pulp capping, a randomized control human clinical trial. That's a figure one, you can see it in the article. And um, you could see in the um, figure, uh, um, J, K, L. And the last figure on the bottom right, you can see the dentin there is very fragile, uneven thickness. And the last picture on the bottom right, there's not even thickness, not completely sealing. When you have MD gain, you have a lot better thickness of dentin. 
And you could see it on the figure M in the bottom right. You could see, um, but the problem, if you look at the letter L, figure L, there's some calcification there. And you could see the arrow here. It's the same, uh, if you remember the Micro CT movie I showed you, where it's a yellow, red, and blue. And we said the yellow was literally like a rock stone. And this is similar to it. Now, when we have growth factor, it's actually give you much better beautiful images and much better beautiful structures. Yes, um, they're not completely mineralized as in the figure H. You could see two arrows. You could see the orange arrow less mineralized and the red arrow is more mineralized. But it's very nicely, uh, much better in terms of structure, similar, mimicking the original structures. If you look at figure G, you could see where is the NFD arrow. You could see there's a blue line. That's the lacunae, sub-odontoplastic lacunae, where you see a lot of odontoplastic activities there for the pluripotential cells to form. When uh, used MTA with the growth factor, we were able actually for the first time to regenerate the chondrodentin. So that's MTA alone. You could see it's fragile and not completely seen the pulp tissue as we saw in the videos. And you could see here in this radio and this histology. Now, if you use them again, uh, you have uh, better outcomes, but it comes with classifications, as we saw before in the figure C or D. But if you use it with growth factor, we don't see classification, but we see a lot better newly formed dentin. As you look at figure H, look at figure H, it's a beautiful dentin. There, you see that dark blue line under the dentin. That's a very important uh, subodontoplastic lacunae where there's a lot of undifferentiated mesenchymal cells to help produce dentin. And this is uh, the uh, image of the new form dentin where you could see the odontoplastic process uh, extension in the newly formed dentin. So I know it's a, it's a long lecture and it's very uh, probably uh, loaded with information. Um, and um, it, it's a lot to uh, absorb and digest in terms of using growth factors and endodontics in terms of regeneration uh, for either apical regeneration surgeries or endodontic pulp regeneration. Uh, but I think, uh, it is very important to understand these structures in the first place, how did they form and the mechanism of their formation. And then uh, I think it, it, it will be a lot easier to understand um, how can we move forward uh, advancing our uh, speciality. Uh, hopefully um, uh, we can move in a larger scale uh, uh, studies to continue our research uh, and human studies uh, in the state uh, using growth factors and uh, uh, MTA. Um, you can look at this uh, clinical case. Uh, I'm happy to, if you guys can, uh, if you guys don't have access, I, I think I can send the decker saying uh, this guy, uh, it's a case report from New York. They use uh, PDGF. Uh, first, they put calcium excited for three months. After three months, they injected PDGF with collagen. After a year and a half, you could see the tooth is vital. Uh, there's sensation. There's function the same. There is reformation of bone here without doing any root counts.
So I think it's always a question. You have to think about the diagnosis of the tooth that you want to do in your regenerative therapy. That's very important. Well, I, uh, I'll stop here and take any question. Thank you, all of you, for attending the seminar. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. Very, very quite informative. Uh, there are certain questions uh, I want to ask you, or many of my colleagues uh, stated that. Um, would you uh, consider, uh, is there a difference uh, as has been stated here uh, between biodentin and uh, routine MTA? I, I don't think um, there's a big difference. I haven't studied biodentin, but I think the most important thing is the uh, two factors, the uh, sealing ability of that material. That's very important. And um, the um, biocompatibility. If you combine these two characteristics with the growth factors, MTA or biodentin doesn't stimulate odontoblast to be committed to the level to uh, odontoblast producing dentin cells. They can provide some sealability and the tissue is not going to be activated. That's why we see a very thin layer of dentin following MTA alone. But if you put a growth factor, then seal it with MTA or biodentin. I have not said biodentin. I don't know if it's going to produce the same thing. Um, if you put MTA following which we did, you could see a lot of activity of undifferentiated zinc cells to be committed to blast to produce dentin. Talking about MTA, uh, what do you think about the MTA sealers? Are they, um, they uh, give the MTA properties uh, while uh, being used as a sealer? And uh, whether when they get extruded, uh, are, are they totally biocompatible? I, I, I would not. Um... I would say I have the best way I would say, I don't think it's going to improve anything else. I think coronal restoration is more important than the sealer. Sealer doesn't help really the, um, the sealing. The sealer is just like a glue to glue your gut percha because gut percha cannot attach to dentin. Okay. So it doesn't matter, you find all these commercial, I'm not a commercial guy. You find all these commercials, they talk about um, uh, this is going to produce a lot better stealing. I don't think, I think if you take AH26 cement, I think it's going to make any difference. The most important thing, I think it's a coronal restoration and good obturation and doesn't have a, a time lapse between your obturation and your coronal restoration. Some of the patient goes, they finish with canal, they come back after one year for coronal restoration. By that time, probably the tooth has been infected, reinfected. So, so you're not very fond of MTA sealers. And uh, I don't think so. I I would not uh, add uh, to my overhead operation to buy this uh, well, extra. What what do you say about epical extrusion of sealers? Do Sorry? Epical extrusion of, uh, of uh, sealer or, or MTA, does it really uh, initiate uh, osseointegration of large lesions, for example? No, there's no way. Uh, the matter of fact, now I showed you in the epical uh, study, if you put uh, MTA, MTA doesn't, is not osteoinductive. There's no osteoinductive capacity. So if you extrude sealer and you're thinking you're going to induce uh, bone formation, I think you're wrong because uh, 
there's only one materials that exists in the world that's LC inductive, that's allograft, which is bell material from human being. And is that also even a very high osteoinductive? Uh, compared to a synthetic material like MTAC, there's, there's no way it's categorized as osteoinductive. If you look at it, search it, it's not considered as osteoinductive by any way. So when you see cases of big lesions being healed and uh, complete bone formation, that means uh, maybe it's, it's attributed to the uh, good three-dimensional uh, uh, obturation rather than the type of sealer or uh, uh, the, filling material. I, I, think, I, I think, first of all, it's hard to base any healing on just a radiographs. If I didn't have a study to prove the concept by principles, like what we did now, so if what we did now, we showed you histology and micro CT. So if you do it in your practice, you take a radiograph, you say, well, based on al Hazemi tell, this is what will happen here because we have proof of concepts. Now, there's no proof of concepts for CLA cements to induce bone formation. You might have transient healing because of the endodonics, but you might come back after two years, three years, and find breakdown there. There's no way the body would accept any sealer as part of their osteoinductive capacity to form band. Yeah, well, this is the the, the dilemma in in the in the dentics. We yeah, see I, I, yeah, we see cases I have to that take are, evidence based. Yeah, sometimes there are cases that are not evidence based. You see, a uh, uh, poor endodontic treatment. Uh, and you and after uh, let's say five, ten years, and you see uh, good healing, and really you don't know. That's that's exactly what Silzer and Bender they wrote in 1963 paper called cognitive endodonics. They presented 25 cases at that time, and they couldn't explain all these 25 cases were terrible cases. Mm. They couldn't explain why they never had preoperation. It's called cognitive endodynamics okay. by Sulzer. Yeah, yeah and um, uh, Sulzer has a famous research where he induced preoperations and uh, he did root canals. Then he, the people they have healed, they did surgery and they found 40% they were not healed clinically. So the radiographs we have had limitations. You could have cortical bone form, lingual bone form, but still there's a lot of granulation tissue inside. Don't be surprised. I'm periodontist. I do a lot of surgeries. I would not be shocked. I see it sometimes there's cortical bone. It doesn't show anything. When you go inside, especially in um, extracted to sites, has been extracted due to failed endodontics. I always expect something there. I would never tell the patient I'm going to place implants until I open. When I open, I begin drilling. I find a huge preoccasion site, granulation tissue there, mm -hmm. and no, no tooth, nothing there, and the radiograph doesn't show anything. Last question. 11 years ago, I was uh, with uh, Professor uh, Tarabinajad. He gave us a lecture in um, a conference in Jordan. I asked him, where do we stand now in uh, regenerative endodontics? And he stated that, well, we need a lot of time. What do you say now? Where do we stand in endodontic re uh, regeneration? I, I agree with him. I, I would say we still get a lot of time to work. I think the growth factor and the uh, MTA study we published, the first a human controlled randomized trial in the world, I think that's the beginning of a long road ahead. But I think it's given us optimism that there's something start to happen there. We could improve on the way and we could improve the materials. 
But I think there's something existing now as a first human study to confirm that we were able to regenerate secondary dentin. But it's a long way. Yeah. Well, it's been a long way since uh, uh, 11 years ago and Rabinaj had stated that, well, yeah. this is really science. You can, you don't have an end to, to science. It's always we, we, a long way. We, we're hoping now, hopefully, we're planning to do a, uh, a second study in the United States, the multi-center. And uh, we'll see how it goes. It will take another five years. Hopefully. At the end, I'm very grateful that uh, uh, you gave us a lot of your uh, time, uh, knowledge, and uh, a lot of uh, very interesting research. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank, of course, Dr. Summer for introducing uh, uh, you to, uh, to me. Uh, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, and hope that in the future we would uh, uh, see you uh, in person in conferences, not uh, virtually, uh, well, due to COVID-19. Uh, at the end, um, the, the uh, Iraqi Indodontic Society would like uh, uh, to uh, send you a, a, a token of gratitude, uh, a certificate of participation, which will be sent to you through email, and it will be uh, uh, placed uh, in the page of the <clears throat> Iraqi Dental Association, Facebook, uh, and, uh, to show people that we are very grateful for your contribution. Uh, <laughs> وتحياتي يعني للامباسدر حق الدكتور سمر يعني خير ممثل لكم حقيقة يعني مخيرة الأطباء يعني قابلتهم وأنا أي شيء تحتاجون يعني بالخدمة يعني البيبر أي شيء ما هو ما عندكم أكسس بالخدمة الله يحييكم ما قصرت شكرا جزيلا الله يحييك من شكرا مع السلام شكرا دكتور سمر شكرا في النهاية أشكركم جدا وإن شاء الله نلتقيكم على محاضرة أخرى في المستقبل شكرا جزيلا